Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Our speaker this evening is a priest of the Melkite Greek Catholic Church of America and pastor of St. Elias Melkite Parish in San Jose, California. Uh, He earned his Ph.D. in Biblical Studies at the Catholic University of America and has taught scripture for institutions including Our Lady of Guadalupe Seminary of the Fraternity of St. Peter, St. Patrick's Seminary of the Archdiocese of San Francisco, Christendom College, and he is now pastor of St. Elias Melkite Church in San Jose. He's a frequent speaker uh, and teacher here at the Institute on our Holy Land pilgrimages as the author of the book, Seen Blood and Water, a narrative critical study of John 1934. But most importantly, he's a faithful priest and believes in God, which is a, which is a, a great gift for a biblical scholar nowadays. So we're really, we're really blessed to have him with us this evening. Why don't we begin in prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Master who loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your holy scriptures. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments, that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and to you we give glory, together with your eternal Father, your all-holy, gracious, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, Welcome, Father Sebastian. Thank you. Good to be here. Good to have you back with us. Tonight, we're looking at the book of Judges. You already had a little bit of an introduction to that, at least the context within salvation history. I'll remind you a little bit more of that as we read into the beginnings of the book. But before we get into the book, there are a few questions we have to ask. You remember, when we look at books of the Bible, we need to begin with three questions. Who is the author? Who is the intended audience? And what is the purpose of writing? This applies to any piece of literature. When you are looking at a book, Gone with the Wind, or the Trilogy of the Ring, or the Chronicles of Narnia, a series, whatever it might be, there is an author to that book. There is an intended audience and a purpose of writing, and often we are not the intended audience of the book that we might be reading. So especially if we are in a different geographical region than the author, or if we are in a different historical era than the author, we are surely not the intended audience of that author. And so we need to try as best as we can to learn as much as we can about that author, that originally intended audience, and the purpose of writing. There are a lot of other questions we can ask as we do these things, but those are the three real big ones. And we've done this before, and I just want to make sure I emphasize that for you, as we do look at any of these books of the Bible, we try as best as we can to answer those questions. Some of those questions we can't answer with any uh, real clarity, but we might be able to narrow some things down, and we do the best we can. We want to at least start with asking those questions to make sure that as we read the text, we're reading it with those questions in mind. Otherwise, the book can become, you know, the devotional or playbook or playground for just about anyone who decides to read it. And I can tell you that if you apply those three questions to any piece of literature, like I said, say The Hobbit, you may have, I remember I read The Hobbit in, I think it was seventh grade. Boy, that was a great story. And boy, look at those neat biblical kind of parallels and stuff. 12 dwarves and Gandalf, and he dies, but he comes back sort of, now he's all white. I mean, you can see all of this clear biblical imagery that was intended there. 
But I had no idea. And in fact, our teacher in school didn't inform us that, uh, that I recall of the background of Tolkien, what was going on in England in his era, and why was he writing the way he was writing? Now, we can't uh, do a whole study on, on Tolkien right now, and that's not my department, but the same types of questions. You ask those questions about who is Tolkien, who was his intended audience, who was going to England at the time, why was he writing what he was writing, then we'll better understand why he made those parallels and things like that. The same thing goes with, of course, C.S. Lewis and all other authors. We've got to know who was the author and intended audience to purpose to write as best as we can. So we come to the book of Judges. The first question is, who is the author? Who is the author of this book? Well, here's an area where we have a little bit of difficulty. It's not like a New Testament book. The New Testament books are pretty easy to uh, discern in this regard because they're such, so much closer to us in history. But when we're talking about a book of Judges, we're talking about a book that goes back to ancient Israel. And one of the uh, problems in that ancient period is the major destructions of the city of Jerusalem and things like that, and wars and chaos, that then eliminate the ability to uh, maybe convey historical information and records as best as we would, we would hope. Think of the destruction of the, the Library of Alexand uh, Alexandria, for example. Okay, so the author. Well, we can learn a little bit about the author by reading the book. Outside of the book, we don't have a whole lot of reliable, extra biblical information about him. Some have suggested maybe Samuel. Some have suggested someone later. It, it's really hard to discern that. But I think it's good to at least discern what we can. And that is an approximate caricature of the author and an approximate range or period in which he lived. So when we look at the book of Judges, we hear about a story, as my brother just explained, that, that is situated between the era of Joshua and the rise of the kings. Moses and Joshua, Joshua brings the people into the promised land. They conquer the land. And then there's this era of the Judges. And then after the era of the judges, we transition to what's usually called the era of the kings. Okay, so that's the, the, the narrative covers that information. The characters in the narrative, they are situated historically in that period. But when was the author, right? I mean, often I think when we read a book like this, we're almost thinking of it like a camcorder. Like there's someone sitting there writing things down as they're seeing them or something. But that's not the case. Uh, the books of the Bible are typically written after an event, sometimes a century or two or sometimes cent many centuries after. So especially we're talking about the Old Testament books. So we have to look at them through, uh, as we look at the text, as best as we can discern who is that possible author that is coming after the historical events that are, that are being uh, described. So as we look at the end of the book, you can turn with me to chapter 17 verse 6. The end of the book of Judges, also often referred to as the epilogue, is chapters 17 through 21. This whole section here is really the conclusion of the book. We're not hearing about any judges anymore. Samson's gone. And now we just hear about this total chaos that we're going to talk about next week that we find here in this era. And that's chapters 17 through 21. Now, this epilogue this conclusion to the book, you know, when you're getting to a conclusion, that's where you're really going to hone in on your main point. So the conclusion of a piece of literature, the conclusion of a speech, uh, a book, if it's well written, you're going to expect somewhere in that conclusion to hear the main theme. And so that's what we find in the epilogue. In chapter 17, verse 6, we hear about a statement that's repeated over and over. In those days, this is chapter 17, verse 6, in those days... There was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. If you turn also to chapter 18, verse 1, again, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Chapter 19, verse 1, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Chapter 21, look at this, 
Verse 25, last line of the whole book. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And as we read the book, we find what, what was right in his eyes was not right in the eyes of the Lord, which is a, it's really interesting here. In fact, you find at the end of the book here, you find these references. But in the beginning of the book and into the body, you get almost like the parallels or the contrast to, that, to this is, and this was evil in the sight of the Lord. And then chapter later, and they did these things that were evil in the sight of the Lord. So there's a stark contrast between what they were doing, which was evil in the sight of the Lord, though it was good in their own eyes. And the problem is there's no king in Israel. Now, first of all, before we get into the theological point there, the historical point, the author is speaking to an audience, as far as we can discern, that is an in an era when there is a king in Israel. You see how that works? He says, in those days, this is, you know, back then, this is like grandpa talking to his grandkids. Kids, back then, in those days, we didn't have cars. Obviously, grandpa's talking in an era to grandkids who are used to driving in cars, right? So the same thing here. In those days, there was no king. So what that does is put us, as far as we can discern, this is speculative, but this is where most commentators begin to try to discern who is the author, is with these verses. And that is that this author and his intended audience are sometime after the rise of the monarchy. Now, how far after the rise of the monarchy? More conservative authors tend to put that author early, time of David or Solomon, and I'll point you some very good reasons why that, that could be. And there are also many authors, the vast majority today, who would suggest that the author is sometime much later, maybe in the time of the split of the kingdom between the north and the south. And for the most part, the vast majority of the book is understood by most commentators to have been written before the Babylon exile. So it's kind of your final marker there, because there's no real reference to a problem of Jerusalem burning with fire or the people wanting to return or anything like that. So it seems rather that you could you could put as your your beginning and end possibilities, the rise of David the king and the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians or something like that. I would guess something on the earlier side rather than on the latter side, but in the end, it really doesn't matter too much because the purpose of the book, as we're going to find, is actually the same regardless of that author being in the time of David or Solomon or sometime during the time of Manasseh, the wicked king. And the reason for that is as we read the book, we find that there's a major problem. The people of Israel are continuously falling into idolatry, that is the worship of other gods, polytheism specifically, but also idolatry, which goes hand in hand, of course, making them idols. The, the book doesn't actually get a whole lot into the actual aspect of idolatry, of the making of the image and worshiping it, though that comes up a few times. The main problem, really, in the end, it is really the problem behind idolatry itself, is polytheism, worshiping these many gods, these false gods, the, these gods that are not the God of Israel. Now, when was that a problem for the people of, of God? Well, it actually starts in the garden. Adam and Eve turned the fruit of the tree of knowledge into a pagan idol, right? Is that the thing? Oh, if I have that, then I'll be happy. God says you shouldn't do that. Yeah, but no, no, I'm grabbing for that one. And so really then the book, uh, you could really see the book in many ways in light. It, it speaks to all of salvation history. Because in the end, as St. Paul says in Romans 6, though, though our sin is different from the sin of Adam, all men sin, right? All sin in the end is idolatry. And so the book speaks first for the first and the intended audience is an audience that is sometimes in the time of David slash Solomon all the way up until somewhere maybe at the time of Manasseh or something like that, or be, somewhere before the Babylon exile. And the audience then is also uh, that same audience, that audience which is uh, 
is living in that era in which Israel is continuously falling into pagan idolatry. And all you have to do is read through the books of Samuel and Kings, and you see this problem, of course. And this is a problem as we did our Old Testament study. This is a problem I really emphasized for you. It's a problem in the New Testament, too, especially if you think about the idea that sin is actually idolatry. So the book, then, is certainly applicable and helpful for an intended audience back then. But I can tell you, it is certainly a book that is helpful for us today and is applicable for God's people throughout all the rest of salvation history, as long as things go on, as long as there is idolatry or as long as there is sin. Right? So the, the, book, uh, the book, while originally intended for an audience in the ancient world, sometime in the period of the kings, is also, of course, since it is inspired by God and has been read and reread and reread every generation from then until today, has always been understood by the people of God as having a continuous application, a continuous warning, a continuous, a continuous catechesis for God's people. Okay, so uh, that is the, in a nutshell, you know, the, the, who is the author? Who is the originally intended audience? What is the purpose of writing? And when we know those things and we go back and read the book in light of that as best as we can, then we're going to be able to distill from the text as best as we can its application for our, for our own lives, right? Now, who were the judges? The book is called The Book of the Judges. It's filled with stories about the judges. Who were these people? I think if we, we recall maybe back to our childhood when maybe we were told stories about the judges, we might recall Gideon, we might recall Samson, we might recall who knows what, maybe Deborah. But in those children's Bibles, or maybe in those stories in Sunday school, often the real theme or the thread that connects all these stories together is sometimes not expressed so well as it should be. But as we read this book, we do find, as we jump into the book itself and look at it, I'm going to show you right from the beginning the problem. And that is, as I already said, the people, the intended audience, is turning to foreign gods. And as a result, they find themselves out of relationship with their God. And when they find themselves out of relationship with their God, they find nothing but death, misery and death. Right? Just Adam and Eve, they separate from God, find misery and death. Rejoin, or re restore the relationship, they find joy and life. Basic principle of all of salvation history. In a nutshell, really all of what salvation history is about. So that's the, the uh, basic thread that connects and theme that connects all these stories. And when we look at each one of them carefully like that, we can see that in every one of these stories, that theme is constantly being, uh, it being emphasized. All right, now there is, before we jump out of our general introduction here, a, a, an introduction to the book that is actually found outside of the book of Judges. Turn with me to one of my most favorite books and one that we uh, studied together for the ICC quite a while ago, and that is the book of Sirach. So if you flip over to your wisdom literature, flip over to your wisdom literature, so you're going to find Psalms, hopefully, and then or Job, and then Psalms. You come through wisdom literature. And then you're going to come to what is typically the last book of, of your wisdom literature in most of your Bibles. And you're going to come to the book of Sirach. Sirach, the last book in your wisdom literature section, or also called Ecclesiasticus. Ecclesiasticus. Now, one of my most favorite parts of this book, which is one of my most favorite books, Begins in chapter 44. So if you flip over to chapter 44, you remember if you were with us in that study that we did, that we spent some time here. This is I really enjoyed this because he tells salvation history. This is a section, and I love these sections of the Bible where in different books of the Bible, different places, authors of the books of the Bible actually jump in and they tell you their version of salvation history. These are invaluable invaluable if we're going to have, have a, a biblical understanding, a correct understanding of what is salvation history. But here is Sirach chapter 44, and he goes through and he tells you the stories from basically from Adam all the way through, through the uh, patriarchal period, the Exodus, and then eventually he gets to Joshua and Caleb, chapter 46 here and now. He's talking about the time of Joshua and Caleb and the conquering of the land. 
And then when he gets to the end of the section on Caleb, chapter 46, verse 11, the judges also, so notice right after talking about Moses and then Aaron, then he jumps into Joshua, Caleb, and now he goes into the era of the judges. You can see for the biblical mind that there is an intimate connection between the story of Joshua and Caleb and the stories that are in the stories of the judges, right? As we are, as the books are arranged as well. We'll talk more about that in a second, why that happens. The judges also, with their respective names, those whose hearts did not fall into idolatry. Look at this. Right from the beginning, this author tells you his perspective on, the, on who the judges were and what was going on. Again, if you read the book of Judges, it's pretty darn clear. But this is the kind of thing that's missing typically in Sunday school or something like that or those children's Bibles when they're explaining the judges and they just give you this story or that story. And they're not emphasizing the real theme of the book of Judges, why God sent these judges, because the people were falling into sin. And what, what was the sin specifically? The sin was worshiping foreign gods. I've said to you many times before, sin is not the breaking of a rule. That is a very late idea in the history of Christian thought. Early Christians understood sin to be the breaking of a relationship, first and foremost. The rule is there to protect the relationship. Don't do this. As I give counseling, say, to a, a couple that are going to get married, I tell a husband, you do this, and don't you ever do that. And I say to the woman, do this, don't you ever do that. Make sure that you always do this. Make sure that you always do that. I'm giving them rules by which they should live in order to protect the relationship, right? If you don't do that, if you do this, you don't, then the relationship's going to break. So God gives rules. Yes, he gives commandments, but they're not just rules for the sake of rules or because God, you know, he likes to make rules and doesn't tell us what they're every time he gives a rule, like a, a loving father to his child, he gives us rules to protect us to keep us safe, to keep us alive, to keep us healthy. What parent listening does not understand this? And again, that's another problem. People just don't understand who God is. He's our loving father. And if you don't start there, then you misunderstand why he gives us rules. Okay, so chapter 46, verse 11 here, the judges also with their respective names, those whose hearts did not fall into idolatry, and who did not turn away from the Lord. Now, that's called synonymous parallelism, Hebrew poetry. Uh, this is the way that the Semitic uh, mind works. It, they, they did not turn to idolatry nor turn away from the Lord. It's called synonymous parallelism. Now, two ways to say the same thing. They love this. This is We like rhyme and rhythm. They like synonymous parallelism. Okay, so what is idolatry? It is turning away from the Lord. May their memory be blessed. May their bones revive from where they lie. Right? Resurrection. And may the name of those who have been honored live again in their sons. Samuel, beloved by the Lord. Notice Samuel right after the section of the judges here. My brother mentioned that to you. Samuel is the last of the judges and the first of what we would typically call prophet in our normal way of speaking. We talked about that structure uh, in our Old Testament class. Samuel, beloved by the Lord, a prophet of the Lord, established the kingdom, anointed rulers over his people, raised the anointed Saul, anointed David. By the law of the Lord, he judged, so he's a judge, the congregation, and the Lord watched over Jacob. By his faithfulness, he was proved to be a prophet, and by his words, to be, he became known as a trustworthy seer. Okay, so that's, look at that, how Joshua and Caleb and Samuel are kind of the bookends on this story of the judges. What that tells you, it, it tells us then is that the, author, the biblical author, and you can see this when you read the book of Judges, when you look at Joshua, when you look at 1 Samuel, you can see if the biblical authors understood the role of the judges as the same in many ways parallel to the role of Samuel, at least early on in his ministry, and the role of Joshua and Caleb and Moses and Aaron. They were judges. What does that mean, they were judges? Well, you can translate this word different in different ways. They were saviors. They were they were uh, directors of the people. They judged the people, and that is in directing them what was right. Uh, all sorts of different ways to translate this, and you get different words throughout the book. It doesn't really matter too much. What I want you to talk more about, rather than the Hebrew words that are behind here, is the character himself. The judge is a character who is 
ruling in a certain sense or uh, the one through whom God is ruling his people during this time of theocracy. When God is king over Israel and through this individual, he is governing his people in various ways and teaching them the ways they shall go. Moses is the first good example of this. Or you could even go back to someone like Abraham or the patriarchs who have some sort of like a judge role. But but we usually refer to the patriarchs. They're a little different. They're a smaller group of people, things like that. But, uh, but when we get into the era of Moses, we now have a, a character who's over a nation, the kingdom of God. God is the king. They are his kingdom, right? Exodus chapter 19. And so there's an individual through whom, and sometimes multiple individuals through whom, and sometimes they're called judges, even in the back in, in the book of, uh, of Exodus, they're even called judges there. So these multiple character signs through whom God discerns or helps individuals discern what his will is. Moses, Aaron, Joshua, Caleb, you could call all of them judges or prophets, if you like. And then when you get to the time of Samuel, you get to a time when the, the role of the judge suddenly bifurcates into two forms. You have that judge who is both a a prophetic religious character and sometimes a military leader. Some of them are more little military, some of them more prophetic and religious. And you can think of some examples, I right? think of Deborah versus Samson. Uh, but, the, uh, but when you get to Samuel, Samuel, the last of the judges, or at least his son's the last of the judges, maybe. Then we come to the time of the kings, when now we have the role of the judge, which was often military and religious, sometimes different eras, more emphasis on one or the other, now becomes two characters. We have now that role is split into two. We have the human king and the prophet. And the human king's job is now to be that, re, that military leader and savior, and the prophet's job is to be simply the religious leader. Okay, so if you combine the role of, say, David and Nathan the prophet, smash into one, you're back into the judge era. Now, that's enough for our general introduction of the book. Now, how about let's take a look at the book and see how the book introduces itself. So if we turn over to the book of Judges now, over to the book of Judges, you're going to go back to your, your Pentateuch and then to Joshua and then you come to Judges. Judges chapter 1. Judges chapter 1 begins with a summary of basically what we get the second half of the book of Joshua. In some ways, it's really just the whole book of Joshua in some way. It just kind of, it tells you that, hey, the people of Israel went into the promised land. They went in and they conquered. And just as we find in the book of Joshua, there are some problems. You go back to Joshua and you find that the people are taking this region and this section and this area, but they're not completely successful at doing that. Why are they not successful? We talked about this in our Old Testament study. If you go back and you look at chapter 1 of Joshua, God told them to be two, two things to be successful. They had to be courageous and righteous. Courageous and righteous. If they're courageous but not righteous, they'll lose their battles. If they're righteous but not courageous, they won't fight any battles. they got to have both. And so we find throughout the, the book of Joshua that the people already are lacking courage in some cases and therefore not fighting a battle. And then sometimes they're not righteous. They're not, they are not with the Lord, and so he's not with them, so they lose the battle too. And so they're not exactly completely successful at doing what they were supposed to do. What were they supposed to do? Go back and read Deuteronomy chapter 8 and 9. We talked about this in our Old Testament study. They were to go into the land and... Anyone who stood up and fought against them, they were to conquer in battle. Anyone who surrendered, anyone who became a member of the people of Israel, think of, for example, uh, Rahab the harlot of Jericho. Think of the Gibeonites, uh, Moses' father-in-law, Midianite. So anytime we see the people coming to encounter God's people and saying, hey, we want to worship your God too. We've heard of what he's done. Okay, join up, get behind me, keep marching, guys. And that's what happens. There is, there's no form of ethnic cleansing. It's the farthest thing from it. It is spiritual cleansing. It is spiritual warfare. Throughout, from Genesis to the end of the, of the Bible, the theme is always that Abraham may be a blessing to all the nations so that all the nations might be blessed and come back into the people of God. That's the theme. 
basic theme throughout. What does Jesus say? Go out and baptize all nations. Theme of the Bible throughout. One, from one man and one woman come all of these people who are the children of God, and God desires the salvation of all. Basic theme from the Old and New Testament. Okay, so here's something like that. Ethnic cleansing. You know, God told them to go and kill everyone. This person who's talking, I don't care what, how smart they sound. They have clearly never read the text very carefully. All right, so judges now. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? So then we hear about them going in these different battles here, okay? And then we hear, though, not only did they, they conquer in battle somewhat, often, verse 19, they did not drive out the inhabitants completely. And then we hear about more battle, and then verse 21, but they did not drive out the Jebusites completely. And then more battle, but they did not, this is verse 27, uh, they did not drive out the inhabitants of, of Beth Shehan. And then, so over and over, we hear in this section, another problem is like we hear in Joshua, that though the people were going out and fighting battles, they're not always that successful. And it's because of one or two reasons, sometimes both. Either they are not courageous or they're courageous, but not righteous. And remember the reason why the Lord told them to go and fight these battles and cleanse the land. What was it? What were they to do? It wasn't to cleanse the land of its people, first and foremost, but rather of those who oppose the will of the one true God and his people who fought rather than became one of. And when they conquered, what they were supposed to make sure they did was remove the pagan idols as they went along. If they leave people in the land who are pagans, or they remove people from the land but leave their pagan idols, there is a danger, a temptation, a problem. And that's what we finally come to chapter 2. It says, now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim. And he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you in the land which I swore to give your fathers. I said I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. Now, you have to know, of course, the Old Testament, back, uh, the, what we've heard before from this in Deuteronomy and Exodus, where God warns them over and over why they cannot make a covenant with the people of the land. If you make a covenant with the people of the land, what you're saying is that I worship your God too. Okay, in the ancient world, when you, one nation has its gods and you have your gods or your tribe has its gods and another tribe has its gods. When, when two men or two tribes or two nations make a covenant, they swear an oath by their gods that they will not break it. And then you are trusting that by their faith and their gods, they will abide by the covenant. You're participating in polytheism. You cannot make a covenant with pagans. Because when you do this, you're actually, you're actually participating in a certain degree in their worship. One, and this is the ancient way of covenants. And then two, making covenants with them means you're going to start to become one people, which means their daughters are going to marry their, your sons and your sons are daughters. And all of a sudden the kids are pagans too, right? So now you got a problem. So that's what we see here. It says, I brought you and I said, I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my command. What is this you have done? So now I say I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become adversaries to you, and their gods shall be a snare to you. Do you see that right from the beginning? There's no ethnic cleansing going on here. The problem is that the people who are in the land who have not converted – when they encounter the people of Israel. Now remember, these people have been wandering the wilderness for 40 years in a very small piece of real estate. Everybody in the promised land knows who those people on the other side of the mountains of Moab are. They heard that Palestine was the, was the, the freeway of, of the, between Egypt to Mesopotamia. If you wanted to go from ancient Chaldea to Egypt, you went up to Haran, then came down through Palestine and down into Egypt. Then you sold your wares and whatever you did, buy, and then you'd take your camels and you go back up the freeway through Palestine. There are camel trains constantly going, never ending, caravans of camels going between Chaldea, across, over the Fertile Crescent to Egypt, and back. 
I mean, think of, for example, when they when Joseph was thrown in the pit, his brothers looked up, oh, there's a caravan over there. Oh, hey, guys, guys get over here. They're everywhere. Okay, so the, there's no possible way that the people of this land have not heard about what happened in Egypt, have not heard about what happened in the cross of the Red Sea, have not heard of what happened to all the people in the, who oppose these people when they come through their land. Okay, so uh, again, any polytheist knows that any poly, they believe there are many gods. What gods do you worship? The ones that you need to be worried about. So it's from a polytheistic standpoint, they've got all the information they need to know that the only God that should be worried about is that God of the, of the Hebrews. And if they worship him alone, then they will be saved. Think of Rahab, right? Even a, a, a low, a very low woman society in Jericho figured it out. Not rocket science. Okay, so now in chapter two, he says, uh, this is verse three. So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become adversaries to you and their gods shall be a snare to you. When the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called the name of the place weeping, weeping. and they sacrificed there to the Lord. Verse six, when Joshua dismissed the people. So now the author now, he gives you a kind of a little setting there. Joshua died and here was what was going on. But now he wants to kind of rewind a little bit and say, now let me tell you what happened when Joshua died. And, and what's wrong right now with his people and why the angel Lord has had to say this to them. So he goes back and he tells you again about the death of Joshua. Now you might, if you're reading your Bible cover to cover, say, uh, isn't this repeated information? I mean, I read the end of Joshua, chapter 24. We hear about the death of Joshua. Why is the Bible telling me that Joshua is dying again? How many times is Joshua going to die? Okay, the books of the Bible are individual little scrolls written by different authors. And the and they are eventually copied and copied and recopied and eventually start to be copied into larger and larger scrolls and eventually become what we call the Old Testament book, okay, a big scroll. So these are not originally connected books. They are independent scrolls. And so the author of this book has to tell his audience about what you and I would call the book of Joshua. But for him, it's the era of Joshua. You see how that works? Okay, so he's telling he's kind of he's throwing you some background information, and now he wants to kind of rewind a little bit and tell you about a particular problem that developed from the time of the death of Joshua until the present moment, and which is why the angels had to say this. Okay, so he says, verse six, when Joshua dismissed the people, and you could use the you know perfect or pluper, when Joshua had dismissed the people, you could do that in English if you like here, but doesn't and the author is trying to rewind a little bit here. The people of Israel went each to his own inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. But they served Yahweh. They were monotheists all the days of Joshua. Well, we've gone through Joshua together. You know. It's uh, not perfectly serving him, but they pretty much remained mo monotheist. They served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work which the Lord had done for Israel. Now, if you had our Old Testament study, you've got that highlighted already. This is, this is really important. Not only do we hear that they remained faithful, trusting in Yahweh, all the days of Joshua, but also those who outlived the time of Joshua. Now, why did they do that? The author right here, just like in the book of Joshua, tells the same thing. It's because they knew what the Lord had done, right? And so for those of you who were not in our Old Testament study, you can make a note for yourself here, just to make sure this is clear in your mind, back to Joshua chapter 24. In Joshua chapter 24, Joshua tells the people of Israel who are with him right there, Joshua's about to die, and he gives them a big long exhortation to make sure they remain faithful to Yahweh. He tells them salvation history from the time of Abraham through the Moses, the Exodus, all the way to the present moment. And then he says to them, chapter 24, now therefore, based upon all this stuff that I've told you that Yahweh has done for you since the time of Abraham to the present moment, now therefore, that is based upon what I just told you, Fear Yahweh and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the Euphrates. 
right from the river. That is be that's Abraham. He was back when Abraham was a stinking pagan back in those days. When he was he was back from a pagan region. This is what Joshua tells us. And God drew him from that paganism and out of polytheism to monotheism and came to this land. And then what happened? The people, his descendants, then go back, they go down to Egypt, and God draws them out of that polytheism to monotheism back to the land again, right? So he summarizes that. He says, he says, put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and, and the gods which your father served in Egypt and serve Yahweh. And if you will be unwilling to serve Yahweh, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether it's the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. Okay, now that's the, he's done with his sermon, at least the first part of his sermon. Now he's waiting for the people. And the people respond. Then the people answered, far be it from us that we should forsake Yahweh to serve other gods. For it is Yahweh, our God. Notice the R there, possessive. Our God, who brought us out of the land, uh, our fathers from the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, who did those great signs and all the signs and preserved in all the ways that we have went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord, Yahweh, drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, therefore, based upon that, we will serve Yahweh for he is our God. Look at that possessive. So they're going to remain faithful. Now, that word faithful, the word faith, I've mentioned this in other studies. It's a horrible word in English. It means nothing to people. I, I asked somebody what faith means. Who knows what they're going to tell me? There's so much heresy out there and so much chaos with the word faith, with, with so many different denominations. I don't know what someone means by faith anymore. In fact, the word faith is a, not an English word anymore. It's not modern English. It's an old English word that has, is only a relic and only preserved in religious context. But the word faith in English, uh, its basic meaning, or maybe we could translate into another English word that's parallel today, that's more used, that translate this Greek word pistis, faith, is trust. If you go through every time you hear the word faith and you switch out the word trust or faithfulness and put trustfulness, you will suddenly see these stories in the Bible or or an exhortation from a father of the church, or you're going to hear it in a different light. All of a sudden, it's going to mean something to you. It means trust. What did Adam lack in the garden? He lacked trust. Lacked trust in the word of God. Right? What is salvation? Trusting in the word of God, Jesus, so that you can be restored to that relationship with the Father. Okay, and anyway, we, there's, we can't do, get through all this stuff. <laughs> That's all, but, but here, notice that. Notice that. Now go back to Judges. We'll get back to Judges now, chapter 2. This is chapter 2, verse, verse 7. And the people served Yahweh, that is, they remained monotheists, all the days of Joshua, and all the days that elders out lived Joshua, who had seen all the great work which the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua's son of it died, so then we hear about his death. And then it says this in verse 10. And all that generation that had served Yahweh all the days of Joshua and beyond, all that generation also were gathered for their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know Yahweh or the work which he had done for Israel. Now, if you had our Old Testament study together, you've got some, that's some major highlighting there, big, you know, big orange, bright, you know, with, I had to put some sparkles there, maybe Elmer's glue with some flashing LEDs, big problem, alarm should be going off here. You have a generation that arises that does not know Yahweh or the work which he has done. That's actually synonymous parallelism, by the way. To know Yahweh is to know the work which he has done, or as to know the work which he has done is to know Yahweh. Right? You know somebody by what they do or how they talk, how they act. That tells you. If you just see somebody standing there dressed the same as everyone else in the room, they're not talking, they're not moving, nothing. You don't know much about them. But as they start speaking, oh, wow, well, you learn something about them. You hear from their word what they know or their thoughts. 
let's say all of a sudden uh, you're at a at a maybe a party or something, a gathering for Christmas, and a bunch of people gather around that you don't know, and all of a sudden someone says, "Hey, my car won't start. I got to get out there. My car won't start." And someone stands up, "Oh, I can help you." Goes out there. All of a sudden, he opens up his you know sports coat, and he's got in there wrenches and drills and everything starts pulling these things out and within three seconds the car is running that guy's a mechanic by watching what he did you know who he is right so to know yahweh uh, that is to say to know what he has done or to know what he has done is to know who he is this is why it's so important if you don't know salvation history you can't say you know the lord You don't know who he is because you don't know what he's done. How can you say you know who he is? You have to know who he is in order to know uh, who he is to understand why he does what he does. You also have to know what he does to really understand who he is, right? And the more we know what he does, the better we know who he is. And the more more we know who he is, the better we understand why and how he does things. You see how that works? The Catechism talks about this as well. All right. Chapter 2, verse 11. Now, I don't even have to read verse 11. You know what's coming. Look at this. And the people of Israel did was evil in the sight of Yahweh and served the Baalim, the false gods, the Baals. And they forsook Yahweh, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods, the people who were round about them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook Yahweh and served the Baalim and the Astro. Baalim is the male gods. The Astro are the female gods. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them, and he sold them into the power of their enemies round about them, so they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whether they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them, right? Not only courageous, but righteous. Got to be righteous. The hand of the Lord was against them for evil. As the Lord has warned, as the Lord had sworn to them, they were in sore straits. Verse 16. So what's happened? The people of Israel have withdrawn from the Lord. If they are not with him, then he is not with them, right? And then, therefore, they can be conquered by their enemies. You can see almost in a sense of of them removing themselves from his protection. Often the Bible speaks anthropomorphically as if God lifts the the veil of his protection. But God doesn't change. He's immutable. The, The people have removed away from the Lord. Just like your child in the parking lot, you say, stay close, son, stay close. Right? Don't go don't, don't to the fire, it's dangerous. The child runs off. You come back, come back to me where I can protect you. And so this is what the Lord says, stay close to me, be with me, and I will be with you. I can protect you, I can care for you. And so what happens? They go away from him, they set up, they step away from him, they go after other gods, and now they're away from his protection, and then they find them un- themselves under the assault of the enemies around them. Verse 16, then the Lord raised up judges. So highlight that word judges. Here we go. Here's your introduction again. The judges who saved them out of the power of those who plundered them. Notice the judge here doesn't mean simply someone who discerns things for them, this or that or right or wrong. They're, they're saving them. Save them out of the power of those who plundered them. And yet they did not listen to their judges. For they played the harlot, the title of our talk, they played the harlot after other gods and bowed down to them, right? If we are yoked to God and our relation to him is in a covenant, our relationship can be described in our creation as father and son or parent and child. But often when God renews that country of salvation history, we get the language like a husband and a bride making a, a covenant, a commitment to each other, that they will be faithful to each other. And so when Israel goes after other gods, it's often referred to as covenantal adultery or covenantal harlotry, prostitution, right? You can think of the book of Ezekiel. He really gets into it there. For they played the harlot after other gods and bowed down to them, and they soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord. And they did not do so. What are the commandments of the Lord? I Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, you shall have other gods before me, right? What's the summary of the commandments? Love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul, and your neighbors yourself. There it is. That's the whole thing. Your neighbors are your image and your God. So that's what it's all about. Are you going to worship the one true God or the pagan gods? Are you going to turn to the Lord or turn to that 
that fruit of the tree or to the things of the material world, worshiping the creatures of the creator? Are you going to turn to idolatry? This is a theme of all salvation history. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge. And he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge, for the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. So they would cry out, oh, Lord, help us. So they would start to turn back to the Lord. And so then he would send a judge. And then now they're moving in under his veil of protection again now, right? They're repenting. They're turning to him. And so now he sends a judge. The judge, all of a sudden a judge appears out of nowhere. And now they're being saved from their enemies. But then when they start to turn away from him again, now they're under their enemies again. So this is the cycle. So it says, and the Lord was moved to pity by their groanings because of those who were afflicted and oppressed him. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and behaved worse than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them, bowing down to them. They did not drop any other practices or their stubborn ways. So their anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he said, because this people has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers. Notice this isn't whether or not they're going to have cheese on their burger or whether or not they're mowing the lawn on the Sabbath, okay? None of that matters if you're not keeping the great commandment, right? And the rest of it is intended to direct you toward that great commandment. They've, they've transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not obeyed my voice. I will not henceforth drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died, that by them I may test Israel whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord, as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left those nations, not driving them out, and at once, and he did not give them into the power of Joshua. Just for the sake of time, we're going to jump down here for a second to finish our summary to chapter 3. Chapter 3, uh, verse 7. Actually, I'm sorry, verse, uh, see, chapter three, verse 5. So the people of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, verse 6. And they took their daughters to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. For Forgetting Yahweh their God, serving the bottom in the Asherah, therefore the Lord, the anger of the Lord, was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of their first enemy. Okay, so we'll get to that first enemy, and now the cycle of the judges, these different characters next week, I want to see them all in one big picture. So you can see Samson, Gideon, Deborah, all of it is really one big story. These different cycles, same thing over and over. The stories are certainly the characters, the details are changing, but in the end, it's really one theme. And we're going to see that next week and how the book concludes emphasizing that. But as we conclude tonight, I want to, I want to turn back and look at this statement here in chapter 2. Verse 10. There arose a generation after them who did not know Yahweh or the work which he had done for Israel. That's synonymous and so, therefore, we know what happens next, right? And that's the problem. That is the problem in that era. And it's the problem throughout all of salvation history. As my brother was saying earlier, before we began, we must know salvation history. We must know what God has done so we can know who he is. And the more we know who he is, the better we understand what he does. But in the end, what's most important there is not what he has done in the past, but what does that mean for me, right? And that's where we come into what's called faith or trust. We cannot trust someone that we do not know. You can't have a relationship without trust, right? Think of a man and a woman, a husband and a wife listening in tonight. Imagine a there is no relationship there. There's no trust. So we cannot have a relationship with God. We cannot have a restored relationship unless we have trust in him and his words, right? We have to know who he is and what he does and why he's done it. And once we know that, once we have reason, then we can have faith, right? Faith or trust is now, what do I do about that information I've got? What is he, based on what he's done and what I know about this God, then I can, I can, by faith, that is to trust, have confidence, have trust in what he is doing right now in my life. 
and what he will do tomorrow and in the future. And the problem that we find in the book of Judges is a problem we find throughout all salvation history, but a problem that is so, so real today. We have a generation today that does not know the Lord nor what he has done. The previous generation, and I'm not blaming my grandparents, or uh, I'm talking about big picture items here. The previous generation has not handed on the faith to the present generation. And so we find now a generation has arisen that does not know the Lord nor what he has done. And what do we find happening just in the story? We find the generation turning to other gods. Why? Because man by nature is religious. We are built for relationship, for religion, relationship. We're built that way. It's part of hardwiring. That's why we always seek out to be around other people and have friends and, and, and have, we, we want to be with people. We want to be with God, right? We don't want to be alone. We don't like loneliness. That's not proper to us. We want, we're built for relationship. We're built for that. And so when we, when we do not pass on our faith, if we don't pass on salvation history, what God has done for his people from Adam until today, and I don't pass on to my children, to the next generation, my personal salvation, what God has done in my own life, the stories of what he's done in my life since I was a childhood until the present moment. If I don't pass that, those stories on to my children, they don't have any reason to have faith. And, and we then find a generation that arises that does not know our God or what he has done. What do they do? Well, they don't become agnostic or atheist in the way that we would think. They become very religious we're all religious by nature. Atheists, agnostics are religious by nature. They all worship. Everyone worships. The question is, are you worshiping the right God? Are you worshiping the gods of the land of Canaan or the gods of America, the gods of the modern world, or are we worshiping the God of Abraham? Are we worshiping the God who created the universe and loves us as a father loves his son? Are we worshiping that God. And the problem today is we find children, generations arising today, even adults now, who do not know the Lord or what he has done, and they have turned to other gods. What we need to do is restore our, our, our knowledge in this generation of who is God and what he has done, and then we will see faith restored. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and to age of ages. Amen. Okay. Mariano asked the question, Father Sebastian, did the judges have the same responsibilities as the as a king? Um, because I heard that God did not want a king for Israel. Great question. And we kind of touched on a little bit, and we certainly touched on this in the Old Testament study. So I would recommend, uh, this was something that uh, you probably want to go back in the Old Testament study and review, but really important question. You know, who is the first king of Israel? Those of you who have been in my studies know that trick question I like to ask. Who is the first king of Israel? Everyone say Saul. No, God. God was the first king of Israel. Really critical. He said, well, okay, come on. I mean, it's sort of, but I mean, that's a trick question. Uh, excuse me. When God becomes man, does do you, do you know what uh, form or category of mankind he comes as? <laughs> if you read Matthew chapter 1, pretty obvious. He's the king. That's really, so if you want to understand the incarnation and why God becomes man as the king of Israel, you've got to start out in the right place to understand who is the first king of Israel. So God's the first king of Israel for sure. And we did address that in other studies. But if you want for a second, we just turn it over to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 8. The background of God as king of Israel, you can go look at Exodus chapter 19. God, he says, you are my kingdom. Right. So they're, if they're his kingdom, then he's their king. Right. Kingdom of God. We use that language all the time, but we don't usually think about it. So then uh, but when we get to first Samuel, we hear this stated very clearly. And the problem there, and that's in first Samuel chapter eight, the people ask for a human king. It says when Sam became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. And brother mentioned that before we talked uh, uh, or tonight. Judges of Israel. The name of the first was Joel, and the name of the other was Abijah. They were judges in Be'er Sheva, yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes for justice. 
Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Please don't leave us with that riffraff, right? If you die, we're going to be in some bad hands here. So they say, Appoint for us a king to govern us, like all the nations. Like all the nations. You hear that? Notice they don't say appoint for us a king. They say appoint for us a king like the nations have. Because they know that Samuel's going to say, you already have a king. Yeah, 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 Samuel. We mean like the nations have. You know, a human king, you know, that goes out and fights the battles right in the front row. We can see him. We can trust him. But we can't trust him. This one, we don't know where he is. We're not sure if he's on the battle line with us. So, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to govern us, right? Samuel understands what's going on here. They're rejecting the kingship of Yahweh. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, hearken to the voice of the people and all that they have asked you. For they have not rejected you. They're not rejecting you, Samuel. But they rejected me from being king. And we get this in other places. You can, you can note in chapter 12, verse 12 again, Samuel says very clearly that Yahweh is their king. All right, so, but they do get a human king, and God allows this. He does allow it. In fact, there's a reference to this back in Deuteronomy 17. God said to them, when you go to the land, you, and you ask for a king, you may have a king over you. When you ask for a king like the nations, you may have a, a human king. But there are a couple of restrictions on it, and he lists those restrictions, right? This is Deuteronomy 17. We cover this. So, um, so the, the, the judge is not the king. The judge is in the era before the human king. As my brother was explaining earlier, we see in that context. You have, if you want to understand a judge, you'd want to understand more like a Moses or Joshua character than like a David or Solomon character. And Moses or Joshua, they had both military and religious roles. And that's what the judge tends to have. Some of them more religious, some of them more military. That's uh, before the era of the king. Father, we've got a catechist here, uh, Matthew Neff, who's asking the question. You spoke about Judges chapter 2, where, God's, where, where God instructed the people not to make covenants with the, with the local people. How would you uh, use this text as a catechesis today for uh, a, CC, a middle school CCD course? How would you use it to kind of communicate this in a catechetical way to children about what they're dealing with? And Ahmed, I'll come to you next. Yeah, so Paul talks about this. This is the, we cannot, we should not be marrying off our sons to those who are outside of the church or our daughters who's outside of the church. This happens all the time, right? Oh, father, my daughter, she's coming home from college. And oh, and when she comes, she's going to, she's bringing her, her fiance with her. And I want them, they're going to come to church on Sunday and I want you to meet him because they're going to get married. Oh, really? Fantastic. He, he's a, he's a, he's a, a Christian. Well, no, he's a Buddhist, but uh, but she's working on him, and he's going to come to church on Sunday. He's a very nice boy. Excuse me? So we've got a problem there, right? We do not – what's going to happen to that girl? Well, she's either going to become a Buddhist or – and you might say, no, no, no. Sometimes I know a story where the guy actually converted. Okay. Is it, do you really want to gamble like that with your kids and your grandkids and generations to come? right? No, we don't gamble that way. So what typically happens though is our daughter Janet marries the, the Buddhist boy and she eventually either becomes a Buddhist herself or out of lack of agreement about religion, they just become irreligious and then the children are not raised in anything. And then the children, you know, the grandkids show up and they don't know, they don't care. Yeah, grandma, grandpa, I don't know, you know, whatever. Does it, Are all religions the same? Daddy and mommy, they say all religions are the same. So, yeah, that's what I would say. I mean, you, there's the problem, right? We have that over and over again. So we need to instill in our children, look, we are built for relationship. What we are in relationship is what we will become like. God engineered us that way. It's part of a hardwiring. So we, be, we become like the one we're with, right? When the kids come home from school and they're talking a different way or something, say, hey, 
Who have you been hanging out with? Do you, have, you got a new friend or something? You're talking differently. You're acting differently. Right? We become, we're like parrots. We learn, we morph into the one in which we are with because God created us for that relationship to grow into his image and likeness, to be with him. So we'd be very careful who we spend our time with. And when we talk to our kids, we can talk to them and say, do you want to be a Christian for the rest of your life? Do you want to spend all eternity in the restored Garden of Eden with your Heavenly Father? Well, yeah, of course I do, Mr. or Mrs. Catechist. Okay. Well, if you're built for a relationship, then you need to be very careful where you go and those with whom you are in relationship because they can easily draw you away from, if they're not in communion with the Lord, they're going to draw you away from the Lord. If they're in communion with the Lord, they'll actually draw you to him. There's an old catechetical model. I'm sure our catechist asks questions that knows this. God is like the hub of a wheel and we are the spokes. So if we draw near to God, we naturally draw near to those who are also near to God. But when we draw away from God, we draw away from those who are near to God, right? So that's how it works. So if we are if we are around those who are far away from God, then we're not near to God, and we can't. It doesn't work. We're stuck, right? So we we need to draw near to those who are near to God, and we draw near to Him. This is our love of God, our our faith in the Lord, our relationship with Him, the worshiping the one true God, is intimately connected with our relationship with our fellow man. And our, and our fellow man who properly reflects the image likeness of God, that is those who are restored relationship with him through Jesus Christ, are those who are going to help us in our relationship, growing in, 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 in relationship and to be like, therefore, our father. I don't know if that helps. Ahmed, go ahead. Hello, father. I actually have two questions. The first one, I think when we, you're talking about Joshua and that the people specifically say our God, like elsewhere, uh, and a lot of times they would say the God of our fathers, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. At these instances, do we assume that they're still polytheist? Like okay. they don't mention that God is their, um, their God as well. They just, does that make sense? Okay, yeah. So when they say the God of our fathers, typically those are usually pretty good con- narrative contexts. The, we will worship the God of our fathers. There's a unity there. Our fathers will worship our God. But you're on to something that's very good. When you're reading in the Old Testament and you hear someone say, uh, who shouldn't be saying this, says, your God. As was right? Remember when Saul does this? Samuel sends Saul out on a mission. And Saul goes and does, he doesn't exactly do what he's supposed to do. And he knows he has not followed the word of the Lord. He has not done what the Lord has said. And Samuel confronts him on this. Why did you not do what the Lord told you to do? And he says, come on, Samuel. We saved the best of the sheep and the oxen for your God. Woo, uh-oh, ding, ding, ding. You know, look, that's, you're right onto it there. You've, there is a problem there. When they say, when they suddenly play hot potato with who the God, who's, you know, the, with the, that pro, possessive pronoun, you know that there's been a breakdown of relationship between that person and God because he cannot say now in the story, we save the oxen for our God. He said, we save the oxen for your God, Samuel, right? Which means Samuel, or which Saul knows now, his relationship is broken. So you're really, Ahmed, you're really onto, uh, onto that there, that following those pronouns is really important. Uh, my second question, um, is there a reason why, you know, like after a judge would die, you know, God would wait a certain time until like they go back their ways and then, you know, send another judge or appoint another judge? Uh, well, okay, so there, the people, I don't know, it's kind of a mystery of why God does the things he does, you know, but we find that the people are with the Lord, and then what happens is the people slowly are drawn away from the Lord, right? And as they draw away from the Lord, as they go after other gods, they find themselves now no longer under the Lord's protection, just like a kid running away from you in the parking lot, and they find themselves now in dangerous situations. And once they're in a dangerous situation, they cry out, right? Oh, God, help me! And they realize what's going on. And as they're crying out, they are turning back to the Lord. What's actually happening is they're running back toward him. And so as they're running back toward him, as they're turning toward the Lord, they're coming back in relation with him, and there simultaneously a judge is arising, right? The judge is the manifestation of God's care and protection of them, 
in their repentant state now. What happens after that, right? Just like the kid who's kind of confident and things are going okay, and then they start kind of slowly wandering away, get being distracted, and the cycle continues. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, Father Sebastian. God bless you all. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.